Hello and welcome to the 2018 Actual Tech Media Virtualization Optimization Ecocast event. On today's event, we're proud to be joined by Nutanix, Cohesity, and Tintree. My name is David Davis, and I'll be the moderator for today's event. I'm a nine-time VMware V-expert, been in the industry a long time, writing, blogging, speaking, and I'm really passionate about innovative enterprise technology uh, and what that can bring you know, to companies of all sizes, big and small. And that's one of the many reasons that we at Actual Tech Media created this event, to help bring you, to help educate you about some of the most innovative enterprise technology available to you today to do it quickly, to do it all in one place, and maybe to win some very valuable prizes at the same time. We also want to make it a very educational event. We want you to get all your questions answered. We have some really high level, really veteran uh, experts in the uh, area of enterprise technology presenting on the event today, and they're here to answer your questions live. And by the way, this is a 100% live event. Things can and do go wrong in some cases, but hopefully not today. It's going to be a great event. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us on the virtualization optimization ecocast. Now, before we jump into it, there's a few things that you need to know. Um, first off, you'll hear from three of the hottest companies in the space of virtualization optimization today. Each presenter will speak for roughly 30 minutes, and then we'll have roughly a three to five minute live Q&A where I'll take questions from the audience. So I want to hear your questions. Uh, I put those questions in the question box there in your console as you think of them as the presentations are happening, and I'll select some of the best questions to ask these presenters live. I know you've got tons of virtualization challenges out there, complexity, and you're looking for solutions, and that's why this event is for you. So bring your toughest questions, and I'll ask the, expert, the experts live. Now, this event is not a competition between the presenters. There's no winner selected here today. As I said, it's an educational event, and we've asked the presenters to focus on what makes their solutions uh, most unique, how they're going to help solve uh, your challenges in the area of virtualization. Now, during the event, we'll be asking you, the audience, a number of questions. Uh, I have some poll questions for you. I'll share the answers to those questions live, uh, and there's also a few things you need to know about your console. Uh, we've got some great prizes to give away today. I'll, I'll talk about those in just a minute. But when the poll questions pop up, you answer the poll questions right on your console, right in the same slide window that you're seeing this presentation. And then, as I said, I'll share the results with you. Now, you can also maximize that slide window, just like, say, a Windows operating system. Click the box on the top right-hand corner of that. That will maximize the slide presentation window so you can see live uh, screen shares, you can see architectural diagrams, you can see the videos that will be played on today's event. Um, you can also, uh, let's see, if uh, one other thing I want to point out, if there's any problems with the presentation today, say you can't hear the audio or the screen freezes or something like that, 99% of the time if you just push refresh on your browser there, that will solve most of those problems. So let's see, we have three $500 Amazon gift cards to give away on the event. I'll talk about those in just a minute in the next couple of slides. Uh, we're also talking about the event over on social media, over on Twitter. The hashtag for the event today is Vert Ecocast. So V-I-R-T for virtualization and then Ecocast. And no, you can actually tweet about the event directly from your console right there using the Twitter icon, and it will prompt you the first time you tweet for your Twitter authorization. That's your Twitter name, uh, Twitter username and password. Those will be kept just between you and Twitter, so don't have to worry about those. Uh, and that hashtag will be automatically appended to anything you tweet. So if you want to test that out right now, feel free to do so. I'll be monitoring Twitter here in just a moment after I'm done talking, and I'll reply to you over there on Twitter so we can get a little bit of conversation going over on Twitter. Um, you can also email the webcast to friends or colleagues from the console as well using the email icon. And that's what you need to know about social. And then finally, resources. We have resources on the console. There if you click on uh, the downloads, you can see that uh, each of our presenters has hand-selected some PDF uh, documents for your uh, viewing pleasure, share with your friends and family. There's actually some really cool, useful information in there. So make sure that you check those out. All right, now on to prizes. As I said, we have three $500 Amazon gift cards to give away today. We will be selecting the winners of randomly from those who are present on the event today. 
live on the event today, I should say, on the live event. And I'll be announcing those $500 gift card winners after each of the different presentations on today's event. So make sure you stay tuned for those. Now, a little bit of uh, legal requirements here when it comes to being eligible for the prizes. Make sure you check out full prize details over at actualtechmedia.com. If you scroll to the bottom of the screen there, you'll find our prize terms and conditions. The URL is also on uh, your slide window right now. We will reach out to prize winners via email after the Ecocast. Grand prize winners must submit an IRS Form W-9 to Actual Tech Media. That's a requirement. And we love to give these prize values away to charity. We've sent thousands of dollars to charity over the years. These are our selected charities. Um, many of our prize winners are very generous and say, you know what, instead of that gift card or instead of that uh, laptop on some of our bigger events, I'd love to just give that money away to charity and help one of these uh, very needy charities. So we appreciate anyone who chooses to do that. We'd be glad to help you uh, support those charities. Now, I mentioned social media. The hashtag, again, is Vert Ecocast for Virtualization Ecocast. Today's event is brought to you by Actual Tech Media. You can follow us over on Twitter, and you can also follow me. I am David M. Davis. I'll be tweeting about the event uh, as the event unfolds today, so make sure you stay tuned on Twitter. You should also check out our other channels to stay tuned uh, to what we're doing at Actual Tech Media. We have a YouTube channel. You can subscribe to that. We post these events. Um, we post many of our interviews that we do with uh, innovative technology leaders. We have a podcast where we interview technology experts called, called the 10 on Tech Podcast. It's available on iTunes. And then we post everything that we're doing over on our Facebook page as well. So make sure you subscribe to the uh, multitude of, of social feeds there. Make sure you check those out. And with that, I'd like to do a little you know, stage setting, if you will, around virtualization optimization before we kick off uh, the event today with our first presenter. So I was an IT manager for many years. At the time, we implemented server virtualization in the data center. We had to buy a, a new SAN. We had to um, learn all about you know, new concepts and new complexities in many cases that were introduced as well. So it made our life dramatically simpler, dramatically more efficient. I love virtualization. I've created many training courses and reading, written many um, documents and blog papers all around virtualization. So I'm a huge fan of virtualization, but it also has, has to be run uh, optimally. It has to be uh, efficient if it's going to make your life uh, as an IT professional efficient. So I know that many IT shops out there have been struggling with virtualization. As I speak at events or I do events like these uh, over the internet, I, I learn more and more about the different challenges that real IT professionals such as yourself are facing. So I know that every IT shop out there, you know, there's, you're struggling to uh, gain greater efficiency out of the data center, greater efficiency out of your time you know, during uh, the workday to get everything done. You're trying to gain greater agility, you know, both for the IT organization as well as for the IT department and the business. The business is making more and more demands of the IT department and IT experts, and you're expected to do things fast, you know, just like just like Google does or Facebook does or Amazon Web Services does. You know, they expect it to be done fast, efficiently, and cost effectively in the data center to allow the business to be agile and to you know massively scale and compete in today's fast paced you know business environment. So you're being forced to do more with less uh, and you're doing you're being forced to do more with the same IT spend or or less spend, you know, in many different cases. So that's the challenge that we all face in general. Uh, whether we're talking about virtualization or storage or networking uh, or applications or development, these are kind of the broad challenges that we all face as IT professionals. Now, when it comes to virtualization, you know, in the virtual infrastructure specifically. Many IT professionals are finding that their virtual infrastructures are aging, are out of date. I mean, many companies out there are still running vSphere 5 or 5.5, 5, um, and they're finding that their, their server infrastructure, their storage infrastructure, their network infrastructure, it's all out of date uh, compared to what you know, it really needs to be today if they're going to be agile and efficient and take advantage of the latest and greatest virtualization features. They're also finding that uh, the, the costs to run the virtual infrastructure are perhaps higher than they anticipated. The licensing costs, the storage costs, um, all these things might be higher than they had planned or hoped 
that they would be. Uh, and also the complexity in many cases is higher than they anticipated. When it comes to troubleshooting a problem or preventing a problem before it happens, uh, they find that it's, it's a lot harder <laughs> than it really should be or, or we hope that it will be. We're also finding at the same time that data size, you know, of, in, of the storage capacity in the data center, it's being pushed to the limits. You know, data capacities are, are sprawling and um, are the, the demands, I should say, on the, the storage are sprawling. I mean, we're doing multiple copies of our backups. We have uh, multiple development environments. We have all this data sitting out there for many years that needs to be available. Uh, it needs to be a high performance, but we also don't have the money to to store all that data. So that's a big challenge in the data center and ensuring that data is protected, you know, that we have data offsite and, and that we're able to access uh, and recover our backup data whenever we need to. We're also struggling to maintain performance and, and uptime challenges. So keeping the, app, the applications in the on-premises data center highly available, up and running at all times, just like we have you know, the same expectation of, uh, say, Facebook or Amazon or you know, whatever online SaaS service we might use, the end users now have the same expectations of us with the on-premises data center. So ensuring that the tier one applications in the data center are always performing and are always available is becoming a, a greater and greater challenge you know, for all of us. So in my opinion, um, we really need to modernize and optimize the virtual infrastructure any way we can. We need to optimize the management of the virtual infrastructure. We need to ensure that uh, we can manage, you know, the, the virtual infrastructure as it grows, that we can make sure that that management is highly available and that it's flexible and scalable so that we can manage, you know, cloud solutions or other hypervisors or, you know, whatever it might be to support the business needs. We need to ensure that uh, our virtual infrastructure is also uh, highly performant, that things are up and running, highly available, that our storage is optimized, that we're not wasting you know, storage capacity that we're paying so much for, and that our data protection solutions are optimized as well. So on this event, I'm really excited because we've got some really great solutions, some really great answers to these types of challenges. Um, our first presenter, um, Brian from Nutanix, uh, will be talking about uh, Nutanix Prism and their Acropolis hypervisor. Uh, Cohesity uh, will be presenting today talking about their secondary storage solution for optimizing uh, storage in the data center. And then Tintree will be wrapping up the event today to talk about optimizing virtualization storage, especially related to VDI. So we have some really great presenters lined up for today. Before we jump into it, I've got three quick poll questions I want to uh, send out to you here and get your feedback on. The first one is on your screen. That is, how many people work at your company? So it should be an easy question to answer. Just select the uh, circle there that corresponds to your company's size. And I'll share the results with you here in just a moment. And you can see how your peers kind of compare on today's event, where we have uh, hundreds and hundreds of uh, IT professionals from around the world uh, participating on the event. So let me share you share with you the results of that now. And let's see, it looks like we have 17% are 100 to 500, 25% uh, are 10,000 plus, very large enterprises. And then it goes all the way down to 6% on the event today are 1 to 25 uh, in employee size. So small companies all the way up to large companies and everything in between. All right, there's another poll question on the screen now, and that is how many people work in your IT department? And I'll share the results with you on this one as well. So I'll give you just a moment to answer that. All right, another easy one. So let me share the results. And it looks like uh, 38% have more than 100 people, so some very large IT departments all the way down to the one-person shop, which is 5% of the audience today. Thank you for that. And then last poll question before we jump into it. This one's a little bit longer. Uh, you may need to scroll down on the right-hand side there, and the question is, what is your industry vertical? So obviously there's a lot of different verticals in the world. So if you don't see your vertical, just scroll down on the list and select the one that corresponds to your company. So I'll give you a, a moment to answer that. 
Okay, I hope you've had time to answer that one. Let me share the results with you now. And let's see here. We have 12% healthcare, 13% finance and banking, 15% technology, and 7% uh, manufacturing. Real good mix of companies represented. So uh, everyone from you know small to large companies, small to large IT shops, and uh, just about every type of industry vertical being represented on the virtualization ecocast today. So thank you for answering those. We'll have a few more polls throughout the event. All right, with that, I'm excited to kick off the virtualization optimization ecocast uh, by introducing Mr. Brian Sir. He is a senior technical marketing engineer at Nutanix. Brian, are you with us? Sure am. Thanks, David. Nice to uh, Thanks for chat with everyone here. Yeah, thanks for being on. Take it away. All right, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, today I'm going to be, you know, kind of focusing just on a portion uh, of our software offering. So, uh, Nutanix, you know, is a software company, you know, with a with a foundation that's built on hyperconverged infrastructure, uh, it, you know, and really a full suite of products and software to, you know, help you build a highly efficient, uh, you know, enterprise cloud that you can do. Uh, as part of this, I'm just going to focus mostly on Prism today and, and really around the monitoring and the optimization pieces uh, to help you uh, make your life easier every day. So with, within the stack, we've kind of really got two pieces of uh, main software that we, we break things up just to kind of clear things up. Is the Acropolis piece is really the, you know, the infrastructure and the, and the virtualization pieces. You know, so that, that covers all your compute and, you know, storage management. And the hypervisor, you know, we support four hypervisors, so we give you that, that flexibility to choose which platform you like to run us on. And then, uh, you know, Prism, everything that's contained within there is, is all your control plane, you know, so that's all the monitoring, reporting, the operations pieces. Uh, it's our automation piece, uh, which we have for Calm, uh, which gives you that, you know, native cloud and, and application automation uh, piece, which I won't be focusing on today, uh, but you can, you know, certainly learn more, uh, you know, based upon our materials. And then, you know, why do you really care about your management solution? I mean, you know, historically, you, you, you know, put in a stack and, and you might have a bunch of different places you go to manage it. Um, we're really, you know, especially around Prism and any of our products, is uh, we're really looking to reduce the, the complexity uh, that you have, you know, for maintaining and operating uh, the software stack within the data center. Uh, and it's got to be able to deliver, you know, a, you know, business value for you. So I shouldn't just go there and click on boxes. It should be able to, you know, help me be more, uh, you know, efficient, deliver services faster, more highly available, et cetera. And then we all do this with a uh, design first, uh, you know, goal. So it should should look uh, as nice as it is, as easy to use. And uh, within Prism, you know, there's a lot of different moving pieces. Um, on the bottom there, you know, the, the full stack management, I'm just going to have a couple of quick slides on that. And we're mostly going to, you know, focus on the, uh, you know, the more exciting stuff uh, at the top, you know, that includes, you know, machine learning and, and some of the advanced features. So first piece, uh, you know, Prism is our, uh, is our control plane, so it's, it's all things. If you do anything with the system, uh, you do it within Prism. So historically, you know, if you put in a stack, uh, you know, to run an application or a VDI or databases, et cetera, you name the workload, uh, you, you're likely going to be compute, network storage, you know, and, and monitoring, et cetera, as part of that stack. So that would uh, typically leave you with a number of element managers, uh, you know, councils that you would go to, to manage the different stack. Uh, so within a, a Nutanix solution, uh, we just have Prism. So it's a single place uh, where you can go to, to manage the entire stack. So whether you're doing store, excuse me, storage operations, uh, hypervisor-based operations, replication, monitoring, et cetera, you're all going to do it within uh, Prism uh, to make yourself uh, nice and easy. And uh, since it is a, a single place, right, so if you're you know, thinking of uh, alerting and health, it's uh, that single point, uh, whether it's for a single cluster or hundreds of clusters, you know, spread around the world, uh, you get single health reporting, you know, from Prism. So uh, anything from you got a bad dim or you're running out of capacity or, you know, a VM is, you know, across some threshold, 
you're going to get all your health and alerting, you know, from Prism or, you know, have it sent out to a, an external, uh, you know, ticketing tool for you. So it gives you that single place where you can do all your troubleshooting, all your investigation, and there's a lot of different ways to, to group and filter that information to make it uh, very easy to consume. Now, kind of as we pivot, you know, to the uh, the more predictive, you know, operations uh, pieces around reporting and planning, uh, we'll start to look at each of these boxes individually. So the first one up is a, is around capacity, uh, you know, planning. Essentially, you know, how do I understand what uh, I'm consuming in my environment? And I can look at this, you know, globally across all the Nutanix clusters. Uh, or I can, you know, just drill down and look at an individual cluster itself. And what we're doing here is we're, uh, you know, looking at both the historical consumption and the growth uh, over time that you've uh, been using these resources based upon CPU, memory, and storage consumption. And then we're going to model that out into the future. So, you know, how much have you been using uh, over a course of time? And then we use that to, uh, you know, estimate the growth. And we, we present that to you in an easy-to-read chart and also in a day calculation. So, uh, you know, this example says, uh, you know, it's clicked on storage and says based upon your consumption, you'll be out of uh, storage capacity in 28 days, as, as the example shows. And it will give you a different day value for each of the, the resource buckets there. And then there's, a, you know, obviously several ways that you could deal with that, right? You could power off some VMs. You could look to reclaim some resources. You could choose to expand uh, the resources by adding, you know, an additional node to it. There's a, a number of ways that you do that, and, and we enable, you know, all those ways to make it uh, very simple. And in the following slides, uh, you know, we'll be, uh, you know, diving into those to, to make it a little more clear how that works. So how the runway works is, uh, again, based upon CPU, memory, and disk space, you see on that, that box on the left, is uh, we look at, uh, you know, different levels, uh, you know, within the, the platform to, to make those decisions. So uh, for CPU, we're looking at both at the cluster level and the node level. Um, and then, you know, disk is, is looking at the container, which is a data store in, you know, hypervisor terms. So, and then uh, around, you know, how do I get more resources in the middle there? You can see we're going to give you a report that, uh, you know, identifies dead VMs that, you know, haven't been used or they're powered off and also over-provisioned VMs, so VMs that, you know, were given too many resources and aren't utilizing them. So these are both uh, essentially free ways that you can get resources back uh, to extend that runway so that you don't run out of those resources. And uh, providing that, you know, those don't give you enough back or you just can't get those resources back from those uh, greedy application owners, uh, then we make it really easy for you to, to determine, you know, how much you'd need to add if you want to add another node or multiple nodes to the cluster to, uh, to meet your project goals. Um, and we give you that recommendation. So how all this capacity works is uh, we have a technic technology called XFIT, and that's really our, our machine learning. And uh, what it's doing is it's, uh, you know, looking at the, uh, you know, actual consumption. It's looking at any seasonality in there and, and the trending. And then we combine that with our, our knowledge of the full stack, right? So we understand hyperconverged, you know, every layer in there. Um, we understand the storage pieces and, on, you know, that if it's compressed the data, if it's deduped, if there's erasure coding, if you add and remove nodes. Um, you know, if one data store is consuming capacity at a different rate than another data store, we, you know, apply all that into the uh, calculations to give you, um, you know, proper uh, runway values for each. And then that's all, you know, as part of the, the learning, that's all churned out. And then ultimately that gives you a, a value in days and a nice pretty chart that you can use to, to help understand what's going on. So then, um, you know, based upon the runway, uh, if you need to, you know, add resources, or whether you have an existing cluster that's not on resources, low on resources, but you want to just add additional workloads to that. Uh, we give you what, uh, you know, we call just-in-time forecasting. And what that is is the ability to do a what-if scenario. So uh, you can pull up the capacity planning, uh, you know, tab and, uh, you know, choose a workload that you want to add. So here's some examples uh, in the second, you know, column there. You know, if you want to model a VDI workload, an exchange, SQL, Splunk. Um, if you just want to say, I'd like to increase capacity by 30% uh, or pick some existing VMs and say, I'd like, you know, 20 more of this one and 10 more of that one, you can build that additional workload and then you can choose, 
uh, which cluster you'd like to try to add it to, or you could choose to build a new cluster. And then what the uh, screen is going to tell you is, you know, uh, will it fit? And if it does, you know, does it shrink my runway from 100 days to five days? Uh, and if it does that, then again, I can try to re reclaim resources or the system will recommend uh, what type of nodes, uh, you know, the configuration, how much storage, memory, CPU, and how many of them I'd want. I just click the recommend button and it spits out the, uh, the estimate and tells me exactly what I would need to know. So it really takes out all the guesswork. You know, do I need one node? Do I need three nodes to meet this work of uh, this new project that's coming in? And then, you know, do I configure them the same as the other ones, or do I need more or less resources, et cetera, right? It gives you, uh, you know, hard and, and defined uh, exact, um, you know, recommendation what you use. But you always have the, the ability to, to go manual, right? If I would like to change and say I want to change the config a little bit because of what's recommended. I like to keep all my nodes the same and maybe this recommended that I need less memory. So you can always manually override it and, and see how that um, you know handles the, the, the calculation. And then next up would be around alerting, right? So um, we've always had uh, you know and pretty much all tools offer you uh, performance monitoring. And uh, as part of that, you know, base offering, you get static uh, monitoring, right, where you set a threshold, and if the metric passes that threshold, uh, it alerts. So, you know, that's functional, but it really doesn't, um, you know, work for everything, right, because some workloads may consume a lot more resources than other, and you may have to have, then, you know, you know start having multiple thresholds and, and try to manage that. So what we built, um, you know, was the ability to, to automatically uh, detect the normal behavior of virtual machines and the hosts that they're running on. And then if they deviate, you know, from that learned behavior, uh, we call that an anomaly, and then we alert you based upon that. So really it watches based upon historical consumption of, you know, CPU, memory, storage, network to learn what the uh, behavior is, and then we build a, a baseline for that. And then if you deviate from the baseline, whether you go higher or lower, uh, we create that anomaly, which then you can get in, a, in an email alert and also, you know, shows up in PRISM, and then you can dive in and, you know, see, hey, that truly is different. So, um, you know, a great example is, you know, with all the, um, you know, patching and performance questions around Spectre and Meltdown, if I go and, you know, patch these VMs and how I truly understand, you know, is that a, a reaction of what um, I did with patching, or is that just a normal behavior of the application at this, at this time of uh, period? So. Um, by being able to understand what's actually happening is, is normal or not is a, is a great benefit. So this is a, a screenshot from uh, actually PRISM that I've kind of cropped the area where we can see uh, this is a, a CPU chart for, uh, you know, for a virtual machine. And, uh, you know, in the middle here you can see where the bell is in the line. That's where, the point where our CPU usage, uh, you know, went above um, the baseline, which is that blue band uh, around the metric itself with the line. And then it, it stayed elevated. It never fully returned uh, to what the normal value was. So you know, about a day later, uh, the system starts to learn that new behavior and it adjusted our baseline accordingly. So as long as it continues on that trend, then that's our new you know, learned behavior. And then you know, if it deviates beyond that again, then it would be considered an anomaly and, and um, you know, would pass that as, as an alert for us again. And then uh, kind of last up, I'll tie this in, is on all our charts, um, we also, you know, highlight if the metric you're looking at is either constrained, like not enough resources or uh, over-provisioned, or it's a bully, uh, you know, for, you know, considered a bully. So, you know, we give up on the left where the third arrow is there. Uh, this one's saying it's over-provisioned, right? So even though I violated my baseline, I'm still using only a fraction of, uh, you know, what the, um, uh, you know, resources assigned to it. So I, I could, you know, easily reclaim some of these resources and still provide, uh, you know, ample uh, uh, performance uh, for my application. So next uh, ties into the to the right sizing. So, um, you know, within, you know, each chart, like I showed there, um, we show you, you know, whether something is, uh, you know, has uh, needs more resources or has too many. And now on the main dashboard, Excuse me. We also uh, give you a widget, which is uh, you know this kind of four corner box here, and we classify with a count, you know, whether something's over provisioned, uh, whether it's constrained with not enough resources, whether it's act, you know inactive, um, or whether it's a bully. 
and then each of these are clickable and they give you a list and, and be able to do it. So these help you, you know, identify either, you know, something that's constrained so it may not be performing as well as it needs to because it needs, you know, more CPU or memory as an example, uh, or if it's got too much of it. And that's, uh, you know, maybe, you know, potentially give you more resources that you could use to, you know, to find those other workloads. And the inactive stuff is just stuff that's, you know, hanging around that needs to be cleaned up, right? So these are VMs that have been powered off for a while. Um, that nobody's using, but it's also uh, virtual machines that are running uh, that are, you know, classified by the learning uh, algorithm that they're um, inactive, right? So they're they're basically using, you know, almost no or very little CPU memory, and they're not generating any storage I/O. So uh, they should be looked at as as being inactive, also. So they're classified here as a list, and then we give you a summary of potentially what you know what you could reclaim from those resources. And then we present this information in a number of ways. This is kind of a list-based view within Prism, uh, which we call Explore, you know, similar to you know Windows Explorer or something like that, where I can uh, just you know click on one of those previous boxes. In this example, I've clicked on the over-provisioned one, and I'm you know presented with a list of all the uh, virtual machines uh, that are you know tagged as over-provisioned, and that gives me a you know a summary description of why they're you know considered over-provisioned. You know, do they have too much CPU memory or both? And then I can obviously click on any of those and, and get more detailed on them and, and choose to take action if I wish. Uh, and then again, in the you know performance uh, you know charts that I look at for individual uh, VMs, um, we get to see up top it'll be uh, you know pointed out if something is over provisioned, um, so it's easy to identify. And then lastly, um, if I go to you know you know say I get a ticket and from an application owner saying, I don't think my app uh, performs well enough, so I'd like to, uh, you know, add some more CPUs to this VM. And, you know, typically a lot of those just go fulfilled and you don't always go and look at performance charts and kind of make the decision of uh, whether they need it or not. So we've um, also populated our, you know, sizing recommendations um, in, you know, where you edit the virtual machine. So if I kind of blindly took that ticket or request to, to go add resources to this VM, uh, it's right there in, in front of my eyes, uh, right below the field where I would uh, adjust the virtual CPUs. It's telling me, hey, this VM is already oversized. It's got uh, too many uh, CPUs, um, and now you're requesting to, to do more. So it's kind of just an extra reminder uh, you're right there politely in your face for you that uh, you can make the decision, well, maybe I should push back on this application request because um, – it's already got too many, and I don't think it, you know giving it more is really going to help them. And I'm um, just potentially you know creating a self my, uh, you know an issue for myself down the road. And then uh, also the ability to you know, beside you know clicking around in our, our you know nice looking GUI is we offer the ability to to you know create reports uh, and schedule them. So um, you can create reports for a, a number of different reasons. There's some canned ones that are built in there. And then we also have a um, you know a nice visual uh, report builder that you easily just you know pick you know do I want a line chart a, a bar chart a table and and then I can choose which metrics and whether I want to report on clusters hosts virtual machines etc. So I can easily through this visual layout you know choose all the data points and the objects that I want to report on and then uh, create a nice report and then those reports can be you know pulled ad hoc manually. Or I can uh, apply a schedule, you know, do I want them to run daily, weekly, monthly? And then I can, you know, pop into Prism and look at them, or I can just ask the report, you know, if you're going to run every day, then why don't you just email it to me? So then every day uh, at a certain time um, in my email box, I get the report delivered uh, in PDF format. And I can look at things like a lot of the, you know, the capacity planning stuff that we saw, you know, through the Prism. I can have that just, you know, those same charts would just be emailed to me with supporting the data, you know, via one of these reports. I could have an inventory of the system, which would give me all my license counts, VM counts, you know, hypervisors, nodes, et cetera, whatever you dream up. Um, I could do something based on performance, you know, show show me all the, you know, top VMs for, you know, consuming CPU memory, et cetera, right? So you have a lot of flexibility in what you, um, you know, want to build and, and add delivered. And then these are great just to, you know, get delivered for the admin. But they're also handy, you know, if you want to keep, uh, you know, like management or executives, um, you know, informed uh, about the type of uh, things that are going on, so you could uh, elect for some of these to be uh, distributed across larger teams. And then uh, also within here, we offer, uh, you know, advanced search mechanisms. So, um, 
you know, it's not quite natural language search, but, uh, you know, a bit closer to what Google wants. So, um, you know, certainly Prism is really easy to use. You can filter things, but sometimes it's just easier to click on that search bar. And, and uh, you know, the example here is um, I could literally, t you know, type in, say, host with 1,000 IOPS less or less than 1,000 uh, IOPS. And it's going to return me a list, you know, similar to the picture, which will show me hosts or if I put VMs in there. Uh, show me a list uh, according to the, to the query that I did, you know, so it uh, uses, you know, kind of Boolean logic in, in a simple to easy form. You know, if I wanted to say <clears throat> VMs, you know, with CPU and then greater than two, it would just show me a, a list of all the virtual machines that had more than two vCPUs configured. And then based upon that list, if I clicked on any, any of the in individual VMs, you know, I would get the, uh, you know, the screen that we looked at before with all the performance charts. Or I could, you know, click that blue, you know, button at the bottom of the list, and that would take me to the explorer type view, uh, with the filters applied according to my search, right? So then I'd be looking at a complete list, uh, you know, if there was more than what would fit on that search page, uh, with all the uh, VMs. So I could multi-select them, open up console, edit them, you know, power actions, you know, lots of uh, things that I can do based upon my search query. And, you know, I can take these search queries against VMs, hosts, clusters. I can look at all types of metrics. I can even type in there, create VM, and uh, it'll open up the, uh, you know, the little uh, pop-up widget uh, that you use to create the VM, um, you know, which it's incredibly easy to create a VM. You just got to go to the VM, you know, view and, and say, you know, click the button to create a VM. But, uh, you know, it's a fast way to, you know, kind of bang out and get the, the job done in a different manner there. And that, uh, you know, that kind of wraps up our, our, our presentation there. David, there's a couple of questions um, that we can answer. And then uh, with whatever time, I'll hang around and answer any of them that uh, have been typed in the, uh, the Q&A section. Hey, Brian. Yeah, great presentation. Um, I learned a lot about Prism myself. I, some really cool stuff that you all are doing there at Nutanix. So uh, we do have some questions that came in from the audience here. Um, the first one is, uh, what about multiple hypervisors? I know Nutanix supports multiple hypervisors, but does Prism also support the, the management and monitoring of those? Yep. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Great question. So, uh, yeah, we support four hypervisors, you know, uh, ESXi from VMware, support Hyper-V, we have our own Acropolis hypervisor, and we support Zen Server. So Prism is multi-hypervisor management. So, um, you know, all those capacity and machine learning and, the, you know, the, the behavior learning all works uh, across the hypervisors, and you get them from one Prism instance. So, um, you know, that list of VMs that I showed, you can literally pop into Prism and go to the Explorer view, and if you, you know, say, show me VMs, it shows them across all the hypervisors, and then you can, you know, choose to interact them with the, the way that you want. Okay, cool. Um, while we answer the rest of the questions, I'm going to pop up a poll question on the screen here for the audience that says, would you like to be one of the first to learn more about Nutanix Prism and Acropolis? If so, just check sure right there. Uh, so back to the questions, another one came in here, and they're asking about um, what about multiple sites if you have multiple data centers? Can a single instance of Prism manage multiple data centers? Yeah, yeah, certainly. Uh, you know, great question. So, um, you know, Prism Central, which is what we've been looking at, is our, our global, you know, control plane. So that can manage multiple clusters, and it doesn't care if they're all within a single site or, you know, spreads across, you know, as many sites as you want, right? So it, it just remotely reaches out. Um, it's a, a bit more of a push operations, right? So if there's a provisioning action, you know, where you want to create, you know, like virtual machines, if it's, you know, an AHV cluster, you know, Prism accepts the request, but then it pushes, uh, you know, that task down to the cluster to perform. So there's not, you know, all this, you know, back and forth traffic if it was a remote site. And then it's, you know, simply collecting metrics on a schedule, and that's pretty small payload back. So it's, uh, you know, efficient to be centrally located, but, uh, you know, work with uh, remote clusters. Okay, awesome. Very nice. Uh, then let's see, a question here came in from Bill. He's asking, can you monitor non-VMs? I'm thinking like containers and physical hosts, or is it just uh, VMs only? Yep, so today it's uh, it's monitoring, obviously, virtual machines and the hosts and the storage containers and all that, right? So, um, 
you know, we had a, 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 a briefly a container offering. We, uh, you know, it was, I think, built on Docker, and now we're kind of pivoting to, to more of a Kubernetes-based approach. So that'll eventually be, re, you know, um, released. Uh, and I could see, you know, that those things will become entities in there that you'd be able to monitor. So today, very infrastructure and VM-related, but uh, future, you know, things like containers, applications, you know, uh, we're already moving that direction. So. Very nice, very nice. Question from John here. He's asking, how often are the XFIT algorithms being run? So it's uh, it, it's constantly looking at them, and then uh, you know, really, you know, if, if you're kind of talking about the VM, you know, learning, um, it really needs like uh, at least a day. Once, like in my example, like how it, it dramatically increased, then you saw about a day trailing. It started to um, to adjust the baseline. Uh, and then it continues to hone that as uh, you know as data comes in as the days pass. So um, it reacts you know you know fairly you know quick, but not so quick that you don't want like a brief you know uh, little spike that doesn't sustain to to dramatically affect things. Okay. Uh, another question here: Is there an evaluation version of it? I mean, like, do you have to have a Nutanix cluster first, and then you use Prism on top of that? So there is, um, we call it community edition, um, which would give you a lot of the things we talked about today, but some of the more advanced learning features um, haven't been available in community edition, but I've been told that they will be in the next version, which you know should be out you know sometime in the next few weeks, hopefully. So yeah, there would be a, a community version that you could run nested or uh, you know on uh, you know people run them on those like little Intel nooks or an old server you have kicking around so it gives you a way that you can get exposed to it um, you know if you don't have access and then uh, you know we run boot camps um, we have demo.nutanix.com which is kind of you know internal and partner related but you know if you have, you know working with a partner they can they can give you the demos so there's a lot of ways you can get exposed to it Okay. And then another question here, uh, what is Prism self-service? Yeah, so Prism self-service uh, is essentially it's a self-service portal. It's um, So within Prism Central, um, you know, if I log in and I've got normal admin uh, operations, I get exposed to, you know, like all the back-end management stuff. But um, self-service is, uh, you know, like if I created a login for you, David, is – I can create a login. So when you hit the same Prism, you know, IP or URL, and you log in your credentials, you don't see any of that stuff. You only see virtual machines that you created yourself, or that ones you were granted to manage. And then based upon role-based access, uh, you're allowed to, you know, maybe just look in, at them and counsel them, or maybe you can edit them. The resources, um, you can create new ones or delete it. So it's basically a, a, a cloud portal that you can use for operations or, you know, self-service to, to manage things. And then, you know, I briefly mentioned our, our Calm product, which, uh, you know, takes that to the next level where it's not virtual machine-based, it's it's applications. So you create blueprints that will automatically deploy, uh, you know, uh, applications for you, you know, so I could create a blueprint that would completely deploy an application stack. So it would deploy the databases, the web tier, the app tier, any load balancing, et cetera, right? All that for you. So, and that, and that gives you like a nice marketplace, uh, you know, catalog that you can choose from. And we give you a, a number of solutions pre-populated and then you can you know, build your own blueprints yourself also. Oh, very nice. Yeah. I like the application catalog concept and the self-service uh, very cool stuff. Uh, here's a good question that came in from Bill. He's asking, uh, can a small company afford uh, Prism and the Nutanix solutions? Yeah, certainly. So, um, I mean, we give you a number of different ways you can consume it, um, right? So we we give you the flexibility to choose, you know, if you want to buy the the complete solution with our, you know, uh, hardware based on Supermicro. We have OEM alliances with Lenovo and Dell. We offer a software-only solution, so you can run on HP and Cisco and some other lesser-known uh, server vendors. And then we also have, you know, even if you're, you know, called, you know, the SMB kind of uh, area where, you know, you're a much smaller organization, we have a product line called SX, which is, you know, approximately about 90% of the features, but it's just restricted to, uh, you know, certain models and, and then based upon, you know, a few features that only enterprises need. Uh, you know, it's a more affordable platform built, you know, for those size organizations and, you know, has a cost, you know, that better matches uh, that for that. And, and as part of that, obviously, we restricted a few features that are not needed and also kind of set a cluster limit, right? So, uh, 
an SMB if they kind of really wanted that price point and those features wouldn't need to scale to like 500 nodes, obviously, right? So that's kind of uh, the idea of that. Okay. All right. Awesome. Well, um, there's a number of more questions for you there in the queue, Brian, but really great presentation. Thanks for the lengthy Q&A, uh, and thanks for being on today. Great. Thanks, everyone. I'll uh, wrap up those questions online. Thanks. Awesome. So uh, if you haven't answered the poll question on the screen, I encourage you to do that now. I'll just leave it up while I announce our first Amazon $500 gift card winner. That gift card is going out to Amber Husband from Mississippi. Congratulations, Amber. We'll reach out to you to deliver your Amazon $500 gift card. We have two others to give away on the event, so make sure you stay tuned for those. All right, so with that, Let's go ahead and move on with the Virtualization Optimization EcoCast. I'm excited to introduce Samir Nori, who is a Director of Product Marketing at Cohesity. Are you there with, with us, Samir? Yes, I am. <clears throat> Excellent. Thanks for being on. Take it away. Thank you. I appreciate it. And uh, thanks for the opportunity to uh, you know, present on this uh, EcoCast. So really, I think you know, the, um, the agenda for today is as uh, you know, some of you or most of you might have you know heard of Cohesity. I uh, want to do a quick sort of recap in terms of you know what we're uh, addressing, what we're looking to do around secondary storage. Uh, talk a little bit about you know our platform and product in that context, and specifically then talk about you know data protection in a virtualized environment and you know some of the the interesting things we have there. And then, if time permits, do a quick uh, you know demo if, uh, if possible. Right. So that's the the agenda for today. So let's kind of jump right in. So really, the uh, the problem around secondary storage, um, you know, before we jump into sort of the secondary storage landscape, let's talk a little bit about sort of primary storage. Um, so over you know the last several years, uh, you know, primary storage is you know way better than it used to be you know a few years back, right? So trends in scale out, you know, all flash um, have really sort of helped you know, change the primary storage landscape. So, you know, the, you know, on the slide you see sort of the VMware stack from a, you know, primary storage standpoint of, you know, uh, virtual SAN, you know, uh, the sort of, you know, vSphere volumes, uh, you know, policy-based management, et cetera. And it's helped sort of change the dynamic in terms of, you know, what, uh, A, the experience that people have when it comes to primary storage and just the, um, the order of magnitude, you know, differences they can see in, you know, performance, IOPS, so on and so forth, right? Um, and so kind of building upon this, you know, what we see is that, you know, as I, as I talked about, primary storage has improved dramatically, right? So it used to be sort of the old world and the new world. Old world was sort of high CapEx cost. You had purpose-built appliances um, and really sort of complex, you know, management and processes. Mo has moved now to a hyper-converged landscape and infrastructure Leveraging uh, modern architectures, uh, you know, distributed in nature, you know, performance is much more enhanced, but also cost efficient, um, and lots of improvements around sort of ability to manage with policies. What we see is, you know, while primary has taken off in terms of the improvement, secondary storage still remains, you know, problematic, right? Um, so for those of you who are, you know, have heard uh, about Cohesity a little bit uh, or are aware of us, you know, we like to talk about this iceberg of, you know, 20% of, you know, what's above the, the fold, if you will, right? So everything you see in sort of the white and on the iceberg is really sort of primary storage and, you know, production applications. Everything below that, below the iceberg, is really sort of secondary data. And that's, you know, any, you know, close to about 80% of data in an enterprise um, and, you know, there is, um, you know, a few different challenges with that, right? First of all, this data that's below the iceberg is growing dramatically, um, you know, from what, you know, someone like IDC terms, six zettabytes in 2016 to 93 zettabytes in 2025, right? So all of us know about sort of the data growth. 80% um, of that is sort of unstructured. Now, some of the challenges here is we see that, um, and, and you know, some of the different buckets within secondary data are data, you know, that's sitting in file shares, backups, obviously, um, archives, test dev, and you know, potentially even analytics. Right? There is anywhere from 10 to 12 copies of um, data being made, you know, for a particular, you know, instance or a, a type of data or a silo, uh, and that by itself, you know, I think 
we sort of look at as being sort of fifty to billion dollar problem in terms of what enterprises are spending today for this. And couple that with the fact that you know there's not been a whole lot of innovation in this space for you know close to over a decade, where legacy solutions a can't scale, b they're fragmented in nature. So each of these different workloads you see of file shares, backups, archives, etc., is a separate purpose-built solution and, and system, and then it's inefficient, right? Um, so we, you know, that's really sort of our mission in terms of um, you know, consolidating you know, and really sort of m making secondary data available on a single platform. And so the way we do that is you know, through our uh, you know, hyper-converged uh, you know, secondary storage platform. Um, so and then you know, a little bit sort of you know, on, on us, if you're not you know, familiar with us, you know, we were founded uh, just a few years back in 2013 by Mohit Aaron who is co-founder of you know, Nutanix and also one of the early leads on the Google file system. So tons of experience in sort of the whole distributed uh, systems area. Um, you know, we're as, you know, growing very fast as a company. Uh, we just sort of crossed the you know, 300 plus employee milestone and we're you know, backed by some of the leading venture capital firms um, in Silicon Valley. So our goal really, as I talked about, is really to converge all these different secondary storage workloads on a single hyperconverged platform. So really bringing the same hyperconverged principles to secondary data and secondary storage. So um, backups, file shares, you know, archives, test dev, and obviously the cloud, you know, plays in, you know, uh, as an integral part of all this. Um, and you know, our, our, like I said, you know, we're really sort of looking to converge this and make it all available on a single platform. Uh, which is our data platform. So how do we do this, right? So um, we're really looking to take these different workloads that you see, right? So today you might be using, um, you know, something like a NetApp, you know, for instance, for doing file shares, right? There's you know, probably another system you have for, for objects. Um, you have data that's coming from your third-party backup sources and, you know, copies of data from a database, right? Could be Oracle, et cetera. Um, and then you have sort of your core data protection workload. So we're, we've built a data platform, a web scale distributed um, data platform to handle all of these different workloads and, and data types and use cases um, and really make it available for all the different use cases I talked about, so file shares, test dev, et cetera, without having to make multiple copies of data, right? So with some unique capabilities that we have in our platform, we're able to do this. Um, alongside with that, you know, we also have uh, our own data protect, um, you know, backup software piece that's fully converged with our data platform, right? Um, and you know, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, in in upcoming slide. So, really, our solution is a software defined storage solution, um, really, and can span all the way from the edge to the cloud from a deployment model perspective. So whether you are looking to deploy this in sort of a you know edge version, if you will, a robo version, which we call a virtual edition, in sort of the core you know on a data platform in your data center or in the cloud. Uh, there's a number of different deployment options out there. So we you know have our own series of appliances, if you will, C2000 and more recently C3000, which is a more denser version of it, but can also run on industry standard hardware from you know the likes of HP or Cisco. Um, and then really all the different data, data you know, use cases you see on the top are all can be run on the same platform. Right? So I think that's, that's a big um, viewpoint for us where we're very good at data protection, right? But we also can span you know, much more than just that and run a number of different use cases uh, you know, like I talked about, right? Which then supports the entire notion of being able to run all these use cases across you know, uh, you know, any sort of deployment type and we span all the way from the edge of the cloud through the notion of a uh, you know, data fabric. So you know, how do we, if you sort of take a deeper dive now into um, you know, the, the backup landscape and taking data protection as sort of that first use case, right? So this is a typical environment that I think customers you know, have in terms of you've got sort of your um, you know, VMs that could be running on, you know, vSphere, uh, I mean, sort of virtual SAN, or perhaps, you know, even Nutanix. You've got your physical servers, you've got databases. And then you see sort of the, the typical landscape that has, you know, um, that exists and the environment that exists to manage uh, and really back up and protect that data, right? So you've got a complex mix of master servers, media servers, and obviously in target storage appliances, um, 
and then you know as well as you know tape libraries right so you know what we really do is you're able to consolidate all of you know you can start off with us really as uh, and that's the the other sort of differentiating part of us we're not a rip and replace type of solution so if you've got an existing backup software piece that you want to continue to use, but you're only looking to replace your more expensive target storage, you can start off with us at the target storage and, you know, from a data platform perspective, right? Um, and then, you know, you can sort of add on, you know, the data protection piece and really sort of converge that with the platform and you get sort of an all-in-one solution, right? Um, and then, you know, with sort of the cloud becoming more important, you know, cloud, we're, our platform was built, you know, with cloud in mind uh, from sort of day one in terms of being able to burst data or archive data to the cloud, use the cloud as a, a third tier, if you will, in terms of, you know, uh, storage of data, as well as then actually run our software, you know, in the cloud for doing uh, more sort of direct backup, you know, to cloud and, and use cases like that. Um, so like I talked about, right, you don't have to, with our solution and platform, uh, it integrates well with existing infrastructures. So like I said, you know, if you've got your existing, um, you know, backup software you want to continue to use from, you know, Veeam, you know, Veritas, et cetera, you can use it as target storage. And then over time, you know, as your needs change or your requirements change and evolve, you could start using our data protection, uh, you know, product called Data Protect, you know, on top of that, right? Um, and so that's, you know, I think really sort of a, a big differentiator for us compared to the other solutions in the market where you can start off with us, there's a, there's a very, very good entry point uh, in terms of working with us. So like I talked about, no, uh, no rip and replace, um, you know, keep your existing, uh, you know, solution, but then, you know, work with us. So, you know, how do we sort of really do this, right? So I think... Um, you know, we, we have some unique capabilities in terms of being able to provide always uh, available snapshots for really doing instant mass restores, right? And we'll talk about a couple of customer examples and how they're benefiting from this. Um, so the notion here really is that um, with our, you know, file system, you're able to take the first full backup and, you know, that then is, is on our file system. The next one, you really sort of take, um, you know, a delta of that. Uh, we make a clone of that of that first backup, right? For the next, you know, backup one, if you will, we'll take sort of the the deltas and the incremental changes and combine it with that clone of the first full backup, right? That results in then having a fully hydrated uh, image, you know, on our file system, right? Um, and that's a unique capability, and that's enabled by, you know, technology in our platform called, uh, you know, SnapTree, and our entire file system is called SpanFS. So I won't have the time to go into that, but definitely encourage you to, you know, visit our website and learn more about SpanFS and sort of, you know, the, the unique uh, capabilities there. Um, and then, you know, consequently, you know, that process then, you know, continues along, right? So this then from, you know, what does this mean for you is, I talked about you get, you get fully hydrated images, right, which you don't get with any other solution in the market. There is a catalog of these images that's always ready, uh, and you have instant access to all of these, which means you have no need to rehydrate images, which means in, in a case of, and we have customers who are recovering, you know, hundreds and thousands of VMs in a few seconds because of this capability, right? Um, and like I said, that's really sort of a, a big, uh, you know, differentiator from us. The benefit for you then is you get sort of instant recoveries. So you, in terms of meeting your, uh, our, you know, RTOs, it's sort of you know, almost near zero. Um, you know, we can also integrate with, you know, uh, you know, pure storage, for example, you know, from a, from a primary aspect, right? Um, so, you know, if you compare us to your existing solutions and what you're spending in terms of both the sort of dedupe appliances and the backup software piece, you're going to get anywhere, you know, starting at greater than 50%, 50% uh, and more, you know, cost savings with us um, in terms of what you'd have to spend for, for sort of the entire stack, if you will, when it comes to, you know, data protection. Uh, so that's, you know, some, some significant cost savings, you know, for, for you to consider. So let's talk a little bit about a customer, um, you know, situation here. So Ultimate Software, and I'm just, you know, covering one of our customers here, um, which is Ultimate Software. They're, you know, $6 billion company, you know, operate in, you know, over 160 countries. Um, and they were really looking in terms of their use cases around data protection, test dev, and cloud, you know, and being able to incorporate the cloud in terms of how they approach data protection. 
Um, so as a result of you know deploying Cohesity, you know with their um, in their environment, they've been able to improve the recovery of their uh, recovery time of their VMs from over three hours to under a minute, right? So that, okay, that's let me just repeat that. So three hours to under a minute, right? So that's just you know, huge order of magnitude difference and improvement in terms of what they're seeing. Um, because we provide capabilities, which I didn't you know, talk about much, but you know, things like you know, global dedupe, et cetera, they've been able to optimize you know, the, uh, the capacity they need. Um, and then you know, because we're a scale-out solution, you, know, they, you can start and incrementally add nodes as required and as your you know, capacity needs uh, increase. You can start small and and you know scale out uh, over time, right? So you know if you sort of look at what you know their infrastructure team has to say and the senior manager there is, we've been able to radically simplify how they do backups and replication, um, as well as you know they've got sort of an entire you know uh, a one UI HTML5 driven that can manage sort of the end-to-end landscape for them, right? Um, so this is just one example of the many customers we have who are using us for, uh, you know, a, a typical customer environment, you know, has, you know, a mix of virtualized environments, you know, physical servers and sort of databases. We probably see as the three biggest buckets, if you will. Um, so hopefully that gives you a sense for how, you know, customers are benefiting from the power of the platform. So let's talk a little bit about sort of in a context of you know uh, data protection in a you know virtualized environment, right? So when it comes to if you take sort of you know the, uh, VMware vSphere as an example, there's lots of different there's many components in that in that stack. There's you know obviously vSphere, uh, you know vSAN and NSX. Uh, there's different mechanisms in place, different support structure for each of these, and limited scalability you know when it comes to these, right? Um, some, you know, the problems that, you know, I talked about earlier are still similar in terms of, you know, sort of complex landscape, uh, different management silos for, for each of these. Um, and then, you know, RPOs, you know, uh, are, are slow and long. Um, and then cloud is sort of not a first class citizen, right? So, you know, as with any other sort of you know, data protection solution in the market, we've got tight integration with, um, with VMware. In terms of um, the you know tight integration with sort of you know vCenter in terms of um, being able to sort of you know, manifest that and uh, capture all the objects that you would see in vCenter in our interface. So sort of on that end, there's that that's covered. Um, we leverage you know the uh, you know, VRA plugin for more sort of you know self-service and you know policy-based management. And in terms of you know moving data, take advantage of you know the vSphere APIs. Um, you know, to spin up an NFS volume on our platform, right? So uh, this is not sort of, you know, unique to us. Most data protection solutions, you know, have that, uh, but just, you know, sort of wanted to point that out. A um, couple of newer things I wanted to, you know, bring to your attention. Um, you know, if you're familiar with uh, VCF, so VCF is the uh, uh, management stack, if you will, sort of the entire new stack from VMware in terms of, um, bringing together um, you know, NSX, vSphere, and vSAN all in sort of you know one integrated solution, if you will. Um, and we, you know, back at VMworld in August, September, introduced a solution, you know, around being able to protect an entire VCF stack um, in under 15 minutes from a recovery standpoint, right? Um, so you know, the protection there, you know, is based on sort of you know, the characteristics of a VM in terms of VM folders, VM tags. Um, and that sort of covers the entire management stack that you know one gets with that you know VCF solution, right? And there's a number of there's a few different deployment modes, if you will, that are covered you know through this. So I'll step uh, through each of these you know really quickly here. Um, so the you know the whole premise with this is that the um, the solution can span from you know, local and remote branches, cover sort of the core data center, and then you know work with the cloud as well. Um, when it comes to sort of, you know, um, and, you know, we've got an extensive white paper we developed and published with VMware on this, um, you know, so there's a link to that. Um, and then, you know, related to that is really a, a third-party independent survey and really a third-party independent benchmark that we did, which shows our ability to um, do instant restores of VMs at scale, right? So we talked, this is, you know, in the order of, the, the tests in this case were showing um, instant restore of you know, 256 VMs, um, you know, in, in sort of in, in Azure, 
Um, and you know, there's, there's a you know link to a paper on that as well. Um, so really, in terms of the you know the the, the combination of our solution and being able to protect the VCF stack works for if you're running VMware Cloud Foundation in a local site and being able to do data protection for um, the VMs and the workload VMs, you know, which are running in a local site. So that's sort of, you know, one option. Um, the next option could be if you're in sort of in a multi-site mode as well, right? So being able to do protection and recovery across, you know, both a primary site as well as, you know, secondary site. If you extend this, you know, one step further, um, is then being if, if you're running or looking to run sort of uh, cloud foundation VMware cloud foundation in you know the AWS public cloud, um, this could then you know do the protection and recoverability of that um, in you know that context as well, um, and you know sort of things like you know RPA and RTO will depend sort of you know the the amount of uh, resources you have available in the cloud for sort of you know compute and storage, but uh, you know the solution will work there as well. And then, you know, sort of the next step, which we're starting to, starting to see a lot more, is around sort of the hybrid cloud, right? Where, you know, um, you probably got, you know, some things you're going to keep on premises, but you're also looking to leverage more and more of the public cloud, obviously, for various reasons. Um, and so then, you know, you can the solution will span across, um, you know, that hybrid cloud environment as well, right? So this is a newer, in the context of sort of, you know, the VMware stack, you know, something we announced, um, you know, back in August, September, and we have you know a few customers starting to you know take advantage of this. So definitely encourage you to check out. Uh, there's more resources on this you know on our website as well when it comes to um, you know and our field CTO Rawlinson Rivera has um, you know a few different blogs uh, you know on this as well. So definitely encourage you to uh, to take a look at that. Um, and I think you know to sort of really bring it all together, um, the the whole benefit here and is really being able to you know recover the entire data center in under 15 minutes across all these, you know, layers of that, uh, you know, management stack, right? So it's a little busy slide and has a number of different components in it, but I think the goal here is to show you that with the entire, you know, VCS stack, there's the ability to obviously protect not just the core VMs, but also the workload VMs and the management VMs and bring that whole thing back up in under 15 minutes. So, um, you know, I wanted to jump through a quick demo here. Hopefully, this will, uh, you know, play as we can, um, and I can walk through this. So let's see if this, uh, if this actually plays out. We'll begin by taking a look at the infrastructure hosting this particular application. In this case, we're using an all-flash virtual SAN hyperconverged cluster. As you can see here, there are a number of virtual machines that are currently being hosted on this virtual SAN cluster. All of the virtual machines have already been protected as part of a cohesity protection job, which is applicable to that particular application. Now, at this point, we're simply going to jump back into the cohesity management UI to start the process of the recovery for that particular application in order to simulate a potential failure or a test scenario. Here, we simply start by clicking on the recovery button and selecting the type of recovery job we want to perform. We click VM, and now we can actually very easily type in the protection job that is currently being utilized to protect all the different uh, components of that application. You can see here that there are 16 different virtual machines where each of these virtual machines are using a different amount of capacity on the primary storage, in total about two terabytes. Now we're able to select the actual job we want to, uh, we want to restore. Uh, we move on and sort of uh, change some of the options in terms of the recovery. You are going to see that I'm going to provide a prefix and a suffix in order to rename uh, the VMs as a, so that they, when they're being restored, they're not having any sort of conflicts with the actual application that is running in the infrastructure. We also have the ability to restore to the same source of destination location or a different one. And in this case, because we're going to restore the entire application uh, together where it's currently being uh, it's currently running, we're going to detach the network configuration settings. Now we're able to look at the different point in time recovery uh, that we have available from a snapshot perspective that are residing on the Cohesity cluster. Here you have the ability to pick any point in time that you want the application to be restored. Once that's done, we click finish and very quickly the job to recover that particular application begins. At this point, 
all of the actual virtual machines that are part of that protection job are instantaneously powered on on the Cohesity platform. So when you look at the actual details of the job, you can very quickly see that all of the different virtual machines that are part of that mission critical application have already begun to uh, sort of come up on the system and are automatically registered into the vCenter server inventory. And after a quick refresh of the vSphere web client, you'll be able to see that all of the different virtual machines that were recovered uh, are now going to be automatically registered and available, but at the same time, uh, you'll see that they're powered on, uh, which basically means that whatever outage was caused uh, from an application perspective could be potentially restored if this was you know, a full-on uh, sort of recovery process. Here you can see that the virtual machines are actually uh, powered on and basically ready to go. Now, when we look back at the Cohesity UI, here's a couple of interesting things. You can actually dive in and look at the, the status of what's going on. You can see the process for powering on and powering off. So you can track everything that's happening with the individual virtual machines. But if you go and look at the summary of the actual job itself, while all the virtual machines are actually running and accessible, the job wasn't completed. Here you can see that the virtual machines are still being migrated from the Cohesity platform onto the primary storage, which is Virtual SAN. So, sort of in summary, um, you know, sort of we can really help, uh, like I said, you know, simplify data protection compared to how it is today. Um, and we've seen, you know, customers like Ultimate Software experience some tremendous, um, you know, productivity boost as well as, you know, cost savings, right? Um, we can reduce costs by you know, greater than 50% on average. And lastly, you know, uh, we're, you know, while we're very good at data protection, we're just not a backup, right? So I think that's a great starting point for customers with us, but our vision spans a lot more you know, beyond that and being able to really consolidate all of your secondary data on, uh, on a single platform. So uh, that really you know, brings me to the end of my uh, sort of presentation and what I have planned here um, so with that, let me pause, and then we'll uh, we'll jump into uh, Q and A. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, great presentation. Um, I love what this can help, you know, vir IT pros out there, you know, do to optimize their virtual infrastructure. Um, while we do our Q and A, I'm going to pop up this poll question on the screen. So out there in the audience, if you want to check out that poll question, it says, "Would you like to be one of the first to learn more about the Cohesity Secondary Storage Solution?" And uh, Samir, we do have some questions here for you from the audience. Are you ready? Sure. All right. So um, first one here is, you know, it, it, they're asking specifically about data protection in Cohesity. Is there a way to recover file and folder level uh, data? Yes. Okay. What about things like exchange mailboxes, like object level stuff? Um, so, to my knowledge, today we don't support, um, you know, Office 365 as an example. Um, but I know that's, you know, something that's, you know, on the roadmap. Uh, you know, I don't have a good sense for, for where that is or when that's planned, et cetera. But I know it has it has come up a few times. Um, I'm not quite sure about other, um, you know, uh, you know, mail environments, if you will, right? Uh, so, I mean, I could, uh, I've made a note of that. I can definitely you know, check on that and try and circle back. Okay, sounds good. Another question here, Edward's asking about uh, Linux. Does it support backup and recovery of Linux? Uh, yes. Okay. And then a uh, question here from Kevin. He's asking about, you know, compliance issues. Does Cohesity support uh, encryption? And is there any way to kind of say what is or isn't encrypted? I do know we support, uh, you know, encryption. So the software you know, does support encryption, um, you know, from that perspective. Um, so I'm assuming the question is more in terms of being able to report out back, uh, you know, on that. Again, I'll have to I'll have to double check and do a double click on that. Uh, you know, I don't want to sort of lead lead down a you know wrong path, but I'll, I can double check on that as well. Okay. Um, and then another question here about. Just more basically, higher level, is Cohesity, is it hardware, is it software, or both? 
Um, so really, we really like to think of ourselves as a you know software company. We're a software defined storage. Um, we do have our you know series of appliances, uh, like I said, in the C2000, C3000, that uh, you know really make it easy for customers from a you know, sort of an end-to-end solution perspective. Uh, but like I said, you know, we can also run on, you know, your industry standard, uh, you know, like a Cisco uh, UCS server line or uh, HP, you know, I believe it's um, DL3260. Um, so, I mean, we definitely see ourselves much more as software, uh, you know, than hardware, right? Although there is a little bit of, you know, that piece to it. Okay. And, and obviously with the about- cloud, you know. Yeah, and that's kind of, that was my follow-on question. So when you talk about running Cohesity in the cloud, um, I assume you first have to have an on-premises Cohesity infrastructure. Is that true? Uh, that's not completely true. So while the majority of customers, you know, do have a mix of, you know, um, on-premises Cohesity and want to you know, um, use the cloud, for example, for more uh, be a long-term retention of the data and really sort of archive to the cloud. So then you're using a combination of both. However, there is also use, a use case where uh, you can run Cohesity, you know, entirely in the cloud for more, um, you know, DR and test dev purposes. And, you know, you potentially don't need, you know, something on-premises. So we're starting to see that come up a little bit more as well, probably in the last, like, you know, uh, you know four to six months in terms of, uh, and you know, if you there is also a you know video we have on our website that shows a demo of how we can uh, do backup of data that's sort of you know, native in the cloud and not requiring you know sort of cohesity on premises. So that is starting to come up more. So I would say the answer to is, is both, but you know there is the ability to run sort of natively in the cloud as well. Very cool. I, I learned something on that. Um, and then what about multiple hypervisor support? Do you support both vSphere and Hyper-V or? Yeah, so we've got uh, we've got support for you know our last release um, in in the August September timeframe uh, expanded you know quite a bit the scope scope of you know hypervisor support we have so yes we do uh, support a range of hypervisors. Okay, okay, and is there any I mean for companies who want to get things completely off site, um, maybe to the the big Iron Mountain uh, facility on a tape, is that possible with Cohesity? Uh, I'm trying to think about that. So I think we we do work with um, you know the likes of a uh, an integration with third party likes with the likes of you know like a crawl for instance. Um, so we yeah. do have integration and support for that. So I'd want to say yes that we do have the ability to uh, to support that. Okay. Okay. Awesome. Excellent. Thanks, Amir. So for those out there Thank in the you. audience. Check out the question on the screen there. If you'd like to be one of the first to learn more about Cohesity, I'll just leave that up while I announce our next Amazon $500 gift card winner. That prize is going out to Alexander Archuleta, A-R-C-H-U-L-E-T-A from New Mexico. Congratulations, Alexander. We'll reach out to you to deliver that gift card. And we've got another one coming up at the end of our next presentation, which is the final presentation on today's virtualization optimization ecocast. All right, if you haven't answered that poll, now's the time to do it because we are moving on to that final presentation right now. All right, now I'm excited to introduce Mr. Christopher Boyd. He is the field CTO at Tintree. First, I want to thank Actual Tech Media for having us here. What I want to show you today is how Tintree is laying the foundation for what we like to call Enterprise Cloud and how it pertains to VDI specifically. So, as it says, my name is Christopher Boyd. I'm a field CTO at Tintree. Uh, I'm also identified as an EUC architect. That really comes from the fact that I've worked at VMware for about eight years directly in the EUC business unit. Anything from post sales, consulting, tech marketing, and I wrote a few white papers along the way, including the Horizon 6 storage considerations. And then that led me to where I am at Tintree, and I've been here for a couple of years. And really, I came to Tintree because when I saw the solution the first time a few years ago, uh, actually at VMworld, it really just spoke to me as far as how it's solving a lot of the problems that we had with storage, especially how it pertains specifically to VDI. But now we're moving forward, and we're pushing really into that kind of enterprise cloud that a lot of people are talking about. 
So really, when people say enterprise cloud, there seems to be some confusion about what that really means. Obviously, a lot of people are comfortable with what public cloud is, and there's private cloud, and we talk about enterprise cloud and hybrid cloud. And you know, as you can see here, a lot of times when you start talking, especially to the business unit, they get very lost on exactly what you mean. I mean, they think cloud, they think, oh, it's just going out into you know the cloud somewhere, and I have no idea you know who owns it and who does what. And so hopefully we can clear up some of that here. Um, and you know, really just help define what Tintree specifically is doing for enterprise cloud. So NIST as defined, the way to deliver it is with these five NIST pillars, and really it's around serving applications like with anything else. So for enterprise cloud, we really focus more on the enterprise applications and then cloud native applications. So a lot of people look at this as this is how we connect for hybrid cloud because again, we have these private and public cloud connectors as well. But the pillars you see here, on-demand service, broad network access, pooling, elasticity, and service measurability, so or SLAs, a lot of people look at them. And we deliver it in one or more models. Again, a lot of people are comfortable with kind of the on-premise private cloud that VMware is really branded very well. And then there's the hosted private cloud, where you're still owning the hardware, but it's sitting inside of someone else's data center. Either way, Tinter can really give you the platform to be able to um, give you all five of these pillars and build what we like to call our enterprise cloud. So to give you kind of a baseline of where Tinter is coming from, we've used the term for quite a while. We call it VM-aware storage. What we really mean is that everything we do, everything Tinter does, is on a per-VM basis. So the old school way, physical data center, everybody that's been around long enough is comfortable with. You had servers, you had storage, you had networking, you had you know one app one server, uh, and then everybody started moving forward to the virtualized data center. Again, there's a lot of platforms out there. There's ESX, there's Hyper-V, there's KVM, there's Rev. We support all of them, but with traditional storage, this was still about putting a lot of VMs in a single location, but utilizing constructs that were really meant for more of that physical data center world. And so you have this large conglomerate storage array and you're really still managing LUNs and volumes and mount points and all the stuff that goes with that. And so what we've done is we've removed all that. And so now we're just doing what we call VM aware storage. We're just focused on managing the VMs themselves, not trying to manage the storage that underlines beneath it. We've removed all those complications. We make it simpler. And everything you see now is the VM, the performance of the VM, the requirements of the VM, um, we can do things like IOP management. Uh, we give you a lot better visibility into what the VMs are doing. So again, that's what we call VMware storage. So this is our Tintree storage universe. This is kind of our entire portfolio. So we do have two different boxes. We have an all flash series. We also have a hybrid flash series. The all flash series is probably our more popular one. This is the one we recently upgrade and that's why we call it the EC6000 series. We can do a full footprint in 2U footprint. We can do up to 645 terabytes and approximately 7,500 VMs. Again, this is high density to be able to run you know, large environments in a very small footprint. But even more than that, when we bring in Tintry Global Center, which allows us to manage up to 64 Tintree devices at one time, now we can manage up to about a half a million VMs in a single pane of glass. Again, we have the hybrid series, which is you know pre-configured flash with the spinning disk underneath, and we can give you again still up to 3,500 VMs in a four in a four U footprint. So then we look at our suite below. Tintree Analytics is a SaaS-based tool. We use this for real-time analytics. This is not a monitoring tool. It is more of a scoping tool to be able to look at how your environment's growing and be able to say, this is how I'm going to grow. And you can look at individual applications. You can look at sets of VMs. Um, we build a lot of profiles around different VDI use cases as well. And you can use predictive analytics to be able to tell you how you're going to grow over the next 6, 18, 24 months so you know where your choke points are going to be and how you can solve those problems long before they ever come up. Of course, we have our global support, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. And then our suite includes VM Scaleout, Tintree Cloud Connector. Uh, this allows us to connect either with AWS or IBM Cloud Object to be able to use it as an offloading location. Uh, replicate, Sync VM, and Secure VM. So we can do full replication, asynchronous, and synchronous. We can do Sync VM, which is pre a pretty unique tool to us, where we can actually do copy data management for individual 
um, time based, so individual snapshots, or you can work in DevOps use cases. I use this a lot in the BDI world to actually manage base images across multiple environments where you can really just update one base image and then you can use sync and replicate together to be able to replicate that out to all the different locations you have. Secure VM just really does our data at rest encryption, um, simply enable a lot of the encryption is done at the disk layer because the disks themselves, again, in the all flash array, they can really handle that. So, so that's our portfolio in a nutshell. But what we really do is around the enterprise cloud platform. And this is, you see all the pieces here, you see things like, and a lot of people will talk about REST APIs and they'll talk about integration and integration with the hypervisors. Tintory really talks directly to the hypervisor and that's what gives us more capabilities than others. But when you look at this cloud platform, you're gonna focus kind of in the middle there on the Tintory Connect. And that's really our collection of APIs and how we can deliver all the stuff that's listed up top, things like scale out, predictive analytics, our automation, copy data management, even self-service. And we do it much easier because of this Tintory Connect layer. And the Tintory Connect layer is 100% enabled by the Tintory storage file system. So again, a lot of effort has been put into this. This is really what kind of drove us forward, um, but we're really expanding kind of our portfolio to do more, but it's really because of the Tintory file system, because we own the file system, we can do this. So we also have an ecosystem that now has been built around it. We started, you know, in the early days, you know, five, six years ago, it was just VMware. But again, today we support Microsoft, OpenStack. We support, you know, now we have the public cloud connectors as well. We support all your um, open APIs, but a lot of the automation stuff that's built in as well. And then, of course, you see in the bottom where we can connect with any compute and any network just like anybody else can. So a lot of people will go to their storage team today and when you, let's say you're building a VDI environment, you're building new SQL environments, you don't know how much is available. If you're the virtual admin, if you run vCenter, if you run Hyper-V, you're the guy that's simply going to go to the storage group and go, look, I am going to deploy 100 new virtual desktops or even worse, I'm going to deploy 500 new virtual desktops. Tell me how the storage array looks. Tell me that this isn't the standard answer you get. Generally, you hear from the storage group and they go, yep, everything looks great, ship shape. And you don't really have any visibility into what you're doing there. They're just simply telling you, yeah, yeah, it'll be fine, no big deal. But do they really know that if you're going to deploy these new virtual desktops or virtual machines in general, whether they're server virtual machines, what kind of workload that's really going to add to the storage environment? Do they have that kind of visibility? What we give you is analytics. Again, this is the real-time predictive analytics that, be, that you can span multiple environments, multiple boxes, and you can create these profiles. And you can look at things, and you can see this is a direct screenshot from there where you can look at, you even get an average VM profile, but it tells you what the I.O. performance is, what the real working set is. So this is the actual VM that's running, not just the dedupe part of it, uh, but also logical space that's taking up. And so now you can take this and you can plan out how many more VMs I can put in. You can simply say, you can take a given SQL server and you go, I want to deploy a hundred more of these and it'll tell you exactly how much performance, how much IOPS you have, how much disk space you have. And even on the server side, we now give you visibility into what the compute side is doing, whether or not you have enough CPU and memory to be able to handle that additional workload too. And this is a tool that's always available. It's SaaS based, it's easy to access and you can create your own app profiles or you can look at the entire environment as a whole. We also talk about automation. This is a big part of with enterprise cloud and how these environments grow. And one of the things we like to talk about is what the workflow looks like when you're trying to say replicate a VM. And so these are some of the steps that you would go through. And this is what a standard workflow would look like around what does it look like when I'm going to replicate a VM? What are the steps that I need to define to be able to get that replication set up? So this is old school. This is the way we used to do it. You go, oh, I want to define a schedule. Do I have any LUNs with matching schedules? Because replication is done at the LUN layer. Does the target LUN have enough free space? Do I have the right storage config build? Do I have enough snapshots? Can I even take the snapshots with me? Uh, do I need to zone a new LUN? Do I need to create a new LUN? Do I need to do a storage vMotion with it? And all these steps, and eventually you'll get to where the VM is protected. Well, with Tintry, we're going to simplify this just a little bit. And so now you simply right-click on the VM, replicate, define the schedule you want, done. And it really is that simple. And so a lot of what Tintry does is we're taking out the complications of storage. We're trying to make things much easier. But again, it's because we do it at the VM level. We don't have to replicate an entire box. We can replicate one VM. 
We can do a group of VMs as well. We could do, you know, a single folder within vCenter and go, we want to replicate the VMs that are in there. You know, for a lot of VDI environments, it's simply going, here's my base image. I want to make sure that's replicated. Or if you have a very important use case, maybe it's executives, maybe it's a specific set of developers, you can replicate those as well. But because we do everything at a VM level, it's much simpler. We don't have to deal with all these other complications. We simply just tell it when we want it to replicate. So this is another piece, and this is where we really talk about the VRO plugin, which we have today, and how you have available a actions previously where you go, oh, this is all the stuff I can do on the storage side, and I can do things around, you know, automate creating a volume, destroying a volume, renaming volumes, and I can even go to ESX and do data stores and VMS data stores, and I can create snapshots, but again, these are done at a much larger level. They're done at the volume level. And so it's not really adding anything to what you're already doing. Whereas now with Tintree, with the plugins that we have, you do everything per VM. So you see here, clone a single VM, delete a single snapshot, set QoS for one VM, or you can set QoS for multiple VMs because that's what automation is for, to be able to do it at a much larger scale, but you can define it individually per VM. So now this is a relevant action. This actually adds value to what you're trying to do around automation and building your own enterprise cloud. So then we go to how is Tintry good for EUC? So we're trying to drive this VDI transformation. I mean, you've heard the term, it's the year of the desktop. People have said that for over a decade, longer than I've been doing this probably. But really what it is, is it's a long transformation. This isn't something that happens in six months. This is something that's taking years. But really what we went to is PC-centric, and this is, you know, 15 years ago, it was all the same. You're very device dependent, individual user, individual device. You're tied into the OS, the, OS, the apps, the user profiles, and within Active Directory. That's how you manage everything. Your life cycle is complex, and you have to decide, well, do I want the desktops to last three years? five years, eight years, and so the capital investment is really high, and the legacy experience is really what users are trying to get away from. We're trying to get to more of this cloud experience. So we go cloud-centric, device-independent. You give anybody a device. They can do a mobile device. They can do a laptop, they can do an iPad. They can do thin clients. And so now we go, okay, let's remove the complication of individual OS, individual device. And this is where we're going to this cloud-based VDI. And so whether that's you're managing it yourself, you're trying to farm it out. I know companies like Citrix are going more to that subscription model where they want to even do cloud-based management even with on-site VDI. So there's a lot of different ways that you can actually tackle this problem. But the idea is, is that you're giving better services to the end user themselves. And so with Tintree, we're already providing that platform for the enterprise cloud. So this is stuff that's inherently built into our technology. So we have things like being able to simplify with a single data store. So now where you know VMware before used to recommend if you were using LUNs, no more than about 100 VMs per LUN. If you're doing 5,000 desktops, that's 50 LUNs. Today, one data store. No more do we have to break this stuff up. We can offload with VAAI, or as we call it in the view world, VCAI, View Composer Array Integration. It allows you to use Tintree-based snapshots. And now we can replicate and you can take snapshots with you. You can storage vMotion snapshots go with you. We can also inc or decrease the amount of time it takes to actually deploy, whether it's Citrix or whether it's VMware, and that's using the VCAI or the VAAI. Again, we talked about the automation, the toolkits, REST API. We have Tintree Global Center, so we can bring everything together, but also latency visualization. That's one of the biggest things for the VDI world because it really gives you visibility you never had before, and it really helps with diagnosing problems as they come up. And we've even seen it where, you know, before we used to troubleshoot a latency issue, and it could take days, sometimes even weeks. And we've had individual events in our own environment where now we can solve this in about 30 seconds. Dynamic QoS, we can isolate those noisy neighbors, that per VM granularity, that's everything we do. And then, of course, we can mix and match workloads a lot better than any other storage environment because you can isolate the performance on a per VM basis. This is our VDI ecosystem. We work, obviously, both with VMware and Citrix. We use Login VSI to do a lot of our testing. We have proven storage programs, both in the Citrix world and the VM world. Just really gives you a good idea of kind of where we're going with everything. And I want to really end on one of these. Um, this is a customer of ours that, that did this VDI transformation, and it was really, they had already gone down the path of VDI, but they wanted to use Tintree to be able to kind of clean up some of the problems that we're having. And this is a direct quote. 
But really what it was about is the administration time. This is the simplified storage platform that we talk about and how we eliminate a lot of the complications of traditional storage. But then it's also the OPEX reduction as well where you're just not spending as much time operating. So first what I want to do is take you on a tour of the Tintry dashboard, give you an idea of the feel for how to get around on a Tintry VM store. So again, like we said previously, one Tintry box, one VM store is one data store within ESX or it's one volume that shows up for uh, Hyper-V or other platforms. So when we're looking at this, we're looking at the entire thing. Again, one data store, so all these VMs exist on the same data store. We have about, what, 270 on here. We support, like we've said, up to 7,500 VMs on a single data store. So these are all the IAPs. The top number is your real-time number. It's kind of an average over the last 10 minutes. The number below is actually a range over the last seven days. Same with throughput and latency. It just kind of gives you a decent picture. The other thing you get to see is when you actually just run your cursor over uh, the latency bar, It'll actually break it down graphically so you can see, you know, host network storage, where it's coming from in a very quick snapshot. Then we also have our performance reserve. So this is how much the controllers can actually handle. Obviously, we have a lot of free space here. Um, and then we have our disk capacity. So and then it breaks it down a little bit farther. So we have our live data, which is you're actually running VMs. We have our snapshots and then you have your free data. And again, any of this stuff is clickable. So if I simply click on snapshots, it'll take me to a view that shows me all the snapshots. And if somebody's taken up a lot of disk space, I can simply sort by changed megabytes. And this shows me our biggest snapshots in this environment. Of course, it's our VROP server, not a big surprise. Or I can just simply look at our different virtual machines. We can sort by any one of these metrics here. So like latency is usually one of the ones we focus on quite a bit. Again, without even clicking on it, this little graphic shows up. Uh, the other thing is, is this is our default view, uh, but we have about 65 other metrics that we actually capture. So you can create your own view that you want. Again, any of this data can also be sent to any central monitoring tool. We generally use VROP, so all that stuff is available to be able to see in there. You can alert, you can do all kinds of stuff based on that. We also have tools um, like our analytics tool that we mentioned before, where we're actually saving more of this data. Analytics, though, is not a monitoring tool. It is more of a forecasting tool and a scale-up modeling tool so that you can see how your environment's growing. Uh, but there's no alerting built in. There's no real reporting feature where you can send out reports somewhere. And that actually takes us into what we call TGC, which is Tintry Global Center. This is our central monitoring or our central management tool. And so we can manage up to 64 VM stores in one location. Or if you do the math at 7,500 machines per, that gets us to almost half a million VMs we can actually manage in one console. So we go to service groups here. And again, it's the same that it is in our um, individual VM store, but what it actually gives us is we can have service groups that span VM stores. So I work a lot, obviously, in the VDI space, as I've talked about. So I've created a pool here that I call app volumes. This can span multiple VM stores. This particular one is tied to a vCenter folder, uh, but you can also do it again by uh, the VM names or the naming convention. So simply, I just have it in here where I created a, you know, the folder that's tied to a view pool so I can actually show you the view pool in the view administrator. We have our app ball test. And again, it's set in vCenter. The display name shows app ball test. So all we've done here is we've just created this group of VMs based on all the VMs that get dropped into that folder. So as view recreates machines, if we delete machines, if we reprovision, if we refresh, they still contain all the same policies. And we can do everything with our protection policies, which is some anything around snapshotting, replication, or we can do QoS and we can do it from here the same way we do it from our regular console and you can simply type a minimum or a maximum. So specifically for VDI, this is one that's good because we usually wanna put a maximum on a lot of cases because we wanna ensure that any group of VMs isn't actually going to bring down the box. And so a lot of customers will actually create a policy. Maybe you wanna put a maximum of 100 IOPS. Maybe you have a development group and you wanna give them maybe 500 IOPS each, uh, whatever that number is. And again, you can you know figure out what works best for your environment, um, either through trial and error or through looking at what your individual applications are actually doing. Um, and then also if you have centralized tools, so we do things like with VMware, you have replicas, with Citrix, you have PVS servers, so you provisioning servers, and that's where the performance is kind of consolidated a bit. So for a replica, you can actually go and you can create a minimum 
IOPS policy. So you can say, I want to guarantee that this replica has 10,000 IOPS available, or the PVS server has 10,000 IOPS. So you can ensure that when you do these provisioning operations, that that central tool that's really doing a lot of that workload uh, is always available, or, or the, the throughput that it needs, the IOPS that it needs, are always going to be available for those given machines, so that nothing really slows down, and then you can really hone in on where the performance is coming from in your environment. So again, it's having this visibility into things like the latency, the IOPS usage, the throughput, the disk space, and having it all kind of right at your fingertips is really what drives the solution. This is why our customers are, you know, they keep coming back to us and, and it's why we've been pretty successful. And, and it's part of the reason is, is because we didn't really focus on VDI as a use case. It's where I focus in, but it was one of those that really made VDI projects a lot more successful because we removed a lot of the complications that come with your standard traditional traditional uh, storage environment. So the, you know, the big LUNs and the management that goes with all that, we've removed all that. You don't have LUNs, you don't have mount points, you don't have LUN masking, none of that stuff exists. We just make it a lot easier to manage. So I want to go back into the dashboard a little bit just to show you how simple the management itself is and even the setup itself. So when you're actually connecting to vCenter and you want to connect it to a given ESX host, um, you're actually just putting in the vCenter information. So you give it, you know, preferably a service account name. Uh, you give it, you know, IP address or the name of the vCenter server. And after that, you're simply off and running. And the other good thing is, is because we can do, because we talk directly to the hypervisor, you can actually connect to multiple hypervisors on the same box. So this box, you can see, has one vCenter server host, a couple of Hyper-V hosts, a Rev host, OpenStack, and Zen server. And we can actually add multiple vCenters in the same environment. So again, it can be a real um, heterogeneous mix of any type of VMs you want. And then, of course, then you can you know sort based on those VMs too to see you know how big individual environments are getting. And then, as we've talked about with our analytics tool, you can actually go in there and you can create app profiles. And those profiles can be by hypervisor if you want to, or they can be by use case. So like API is a use case or SQL is a use case, or a given app stack where you have a web server, a database server, an application server, and you can create those profiles to see how big those in individual environments are growing. And you can look at things like, you know, what are the CPU requirements for that environment? What are the disk space requirements? What are the IOPS requirements? And so you can do real planning for how your environment's going to grow. So again, the settings here are really simple. We just added the vCenter name. We added the service account that we use, which is our API account, and you're simply off and running. And it really is that simple of an environment to set up. So again, you know, everything you're gonna see is, is at a snapshot. Um, I also wanted to kind of give you an idea of what the hardware itself looks like. This is somewhere where, you know, we always say the hardware is kind of the boring part. The software is really where we do all the magic, but everybody wants to see specifically what the hardware looks like. So again, this is our all flash array. We have 24 bays. We have drive sizes anywhere from, you know, 500 meg up to 8 terabytes, depending on the configuration you're trying to put together. It's essentially RAID DP. So for the online disks, we have 23 online. You'll lose two um, for the redundancy or for the parity, and then you'll have one is your online spare. So again, you can lose up to three disks in any environment and you're still up and running. Uh, we actually start out, you can actually buy uh, one device half populated, so we would give you 13 disks. And then as you want to grow your environment, and so you use tools like our analytics tool to grow this environment, you can grow it by single disk, you can simply fill it all the way up. There's no shelves to add, um, there's no trying to figure out how many controllers go with how many disks. Um, these are self-contained, so this T5060 that you see here, um, that's the entire thing. It's one 2U box. Now, if you fill that up, you use up all the disk space, you use up all the controller space, then you simply would just move on to an additional box. Uh, we just give you the advantage of starting with a set number of disk space, and if you have enough headroom or you need more disk space and the controller can handle more load, we can simply just add this as you go. And you see things like the different controllers. Our EC6000 series is our newest series. It has a few more pieces when it comes to the actual controllers themselves as far as uh, NIC ports. Um, and again, we can do you know gig, 10 gig, or 40 gig as well. So thank you. Great presentation, Chris. Thank you so much. Uh, so we have a lot of questions here for you from the audience. Let's see. The first one is, say I have an existing virtual infrastructure with an aging iSCSI SAN. 
how does Tintry make my life easier as a, say, a vSphere admin? So everything we do is always around virtualization as a whole. I mean, iSCSI in general, a lot of people are still using iSCSI today for all kinds of direct attached uh, functions. And it's built around, you know, kind of some of the same old constructs around, um, you know, traditional storage and, and more focused on the disk and um, volumes, LUNs, whatever you want to look at. Whereas the way we organize everything is 100% by the VMs themselves. So if you're used to doing things through, say, vCenter or any other management tool where it organizes it by VM, you're going to be very comfortable in the Tintry console because you're going to be looking at it the same way. You're looking at individual VMs. We don't organize by files. We don't organize by volumes or LUNs or any of that other stuff. We do everything by the VMs. Any management you do is going to be per VM, and so we can automate based on that as well. So we talk about things like QoS. We talk about the individual VM control. We talk about, you'll hear terms like swim lanes we use quite a bit. where We can give individualized performance, but again, we can automate based on that because, again, everything we do is organized the same way you manage your virtualization environment today. Very nice, very nice. Okay, another question came in here, and that is, what if I have multiple Tintree arrays, say across multiple data centers, is there some way to centrally manage those? Definitely, and this this is one, you know, we focus pretty heavily in the enterprise space. I mean, we do a lot a across a lot of different verticals as well. So we have customers, you know, thousands of customers across the globe. And in the enterprise world, obviously you're gonna have a lot of large environments. We have customers, in fact, we have one customer that has over a hundred of our Tintree VM stores deployed across the world. Um, so what we use is we call Tintree Global Center. We call it TGC for short. We have both a um, ESX-based version because it's a virtual appliance or the Hyper-V version, so depending on your environment. Um, and you're able to manage up to 64 devices from a single console. Now, part of um, our all-flash array lineup, we can do we can actually run as many as 7,500 virtual machines on a single VM store, or even a single data store. So if you put 64 of those in one place, theoretically you can manage upwards of about a half a million virtual machines in one console. We do actually have a customer, like I was saying, they have close to 100 uh, Tintree devices, but in one of their TGCs are actually managing, I think about 200,000 VMs today. <laughs> wow, that's hard to imagine, 200,000 VMs in a single, <laughs> single console. Um, very cool. So, I mean, the, the Tintree VM store management console uh, is very easy to use, but say I'm a vSphere admin, can I manage Tintree directly from the vSphere web client? Definitely. And this, this comes down to kind of your lines of delineation and who owns what. And, you know, when Tintree comes in, obviously a lot of the storage teams are the ones that set it up. They're the ones that look at the Tintree console. But the guys that actually manage the VMs on a daily basis are your VM admins, your VM engineers. And you don't necessarily want to give them access to the Tintree console to be able to do everything you can there. So 99% 99 of the functionality that you have in the Tintree console, even within TGC itself, you can do through vCenter. So we have a vCenter vCenter vSphere web client plugin. Uh, still getting used to the whole web client thing. They're kind of prying away my fat client. So, uh, but the web client plugin allows you to do all the native Tintree stuff. You can even see the graphs of the same usage. So when we show you things like IOPS and latency and disk usage, you can see that through uh, the vSphere web client as well. So, and that's an updated client that we have. In fact, if you go to our support page, you can look and see what version we have. It just makes sure that we're always, you know, up to date with the latest versions of vCenter and the vCSA, and it all works and it integrates really well. Very cool, very cool. Um, let's see, another question here that's come in multiple times is, does Tintry support hypervisors other than vSphere? Yeah, and this is probably where uh, one of the biggest values that we bring is, you know, obviously we started, we shipped our first boxes maybe six, seven years ago, and we started with just supporting ESX. Um, it's a lot of where our DNA came from. Our founder came from uh, VMware. I came from VMware. A lot of the guys I work with came from VMware. But, um, you know, over time we realized that's not the only hypervisor in the world. And so adding support for things like Zen Server, OpenStack, we have a Cinder driver for OpenStack, uh, Hyper-V, KVM. And so now when you go into a single Tintree device, you can actually set up all these different hypervisors on one Tintree box. So if you have a mixed environment or if you're strictly Hyper-V, and we have a lot more Hyper-V customers coming, some of our largest customers, we have a large VDI customer that's doing um, close to 40,000 desktops now, and it's all living on Hyper-V using uh, Zen Desktop to manage their desktop. So um, it's definitely, you know, we understand 
that the world is bigger than just uh, VMware, even in the virtualization circles. And so we want to make sure that you know any environment that you're trying to build, again, it comes down to the virtual machines themselves, not just an individualized hypervisor. Awesome. Awesome. So, I mean, you talked a lot about VDI in your presentation here. I've interviewed you about VDI and Tintree before. I, I'm curious, what makes Tintree better than other storage solutions specifically for VDI? So a lot of it at a high level is going to be operationally speaking. So one of the things, and, and I go back to this quite a bit, is in the old days when I was at VMware, we were doing EUC, VDI, um, you had these large environments coming in. There was a lot of healthcare customers, financial customers, and they start getting over those few hundred desktops. Now you're talking about a few thousand desktops, even tens of thousands of desktops. One of our Tintry customers, again, the one that has 200,000, that's a VDI customer. Um, when you looked at the storage architecture, just uh, around the data stores themselves was an architecture to itself. And the reason is, is because VMware actually had recommendations on how many virtual machines you could actually run per data store. So if you were doing LUNs, they actually had a recommendation even as little as five years ago that you could only do about 120 VMs per LUN. Um, even if you went to volumes, and this is where NFS became a big deal for virtual desktops, then they upped that number to about 500 virtual desktops per volume. But even still, if you were doing 50,000 desktops, even if you're doing 5,000 desktops, that's at least a dozen data stores that you have to manage. Now with Tintree, Literally one Tintry box, which we can manage up to 7,500 VMs, is a single data store. We're not limited by the constructs of old, of the LUNs and the volumes. We're not limited by VMware saying this data store can only handle so much because we wrote our own file system for it. So operationally speaking, it makes sense. Um, I'd say uh, of our top line business, 35 to 40 percent is VDI, strictly for that reason. And it's really why I came over to Tintry. Once I saw the solution, once I saw what it could do for virtual desktops, how much easier it was to manage, um, and a lot of the stuff that we automate because we have you know, open APIs, it's all REST APIs available, we integrate really well, not just with VMware, but also with Citrix and Zen Desktop and Zen Server. Um, so it's just being able to kind of handle everything in one place and not have to do this, these piecemeal solutions anymore. Yeah, and storage has been historically one of the huge challenges with successfully implementing VDI. So it sounds like Tantry's finally making VDI you know, as easy as it should be to implement. So uh, good job, good job on that. And and last question I think we have time for here is, you know, you showed and, and we talked a lot about the ease of use in Tintree management. Is there a way for people to see that in action without buying an array, let's say? Definitely. So, and, and this was one that we really wanted to get more out there. I mean, obviously we have a lot of customers that do POCs, try before you buy, but you really want to get a feel for it because it's so different than any other storage console out there and because it's so VM focused. So you can simply go to try.tintree.com or explore.tintree.com, uh, either one of those. And there's all kinds of walkthroughs and it'll look just like um, our interface, you can actually see where the buttons are, what the screens look like, and the kind of information that we talk about. We talk about the visibility and how we give you visibility into latency, into IOPS, and you'll see all that there, and you'll be able to kind of click through a few little um, guided tutorials. Excellent, excellent. Well, I think that's all the time we have for live questions, but thanks so much for being on the event today, Chris. Thank you very much, David. For more information on Tintree, visit Tintree.com and check out the resource in your console. All right, great presentation there from Chris. Uh, some really good Q&A. Uh, I popped up the final poll question on the screen right now, and that is, would you like to be one of the first to learn more about the Tintry VMAware storage solution? I'll leave that up on the screen while I announce our final gift card winner. That final gift card is going out to Robert Perfianco from Georgia. Again, Robert Pefianco, sorry, P-E-F-I-A-N-C-O from Georgia. Congratulations, Robert. Uh, thank you, everyone who joined us on the event today. Just a few more things before we wrap it up. Make sure you answer that question on the screen. Um, I do want to point out that there are a number of other ways to join us on future events uh, and also to learn more about our innovative uh, technology solutions that we talk about at Actual Tech Media. Our 10 on Tech podcast is available on iTunes. You can subscribe to that. You can register for all of our events over at events.actualtechmedia.com. 
there's the EcoCast series, the MegaCast series. We have our IT virtual summit multiple times a year, as well as uh, numerous uh, webinars happening just about every week. So make sure you check those out and register for those. And then finally, I hope you'll join us for our next event from Actual Tech Media. That is the Data Protection Megacast event on February 7th, 2018. It's going to be a great event. You can register at events.actualtechmedia.com. And that's all we have today for the Virtualization Optimization Ecocast. Thanks for joining us, and have a great day. Bye-bye.